Good morning, everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Helena Nan. I'm the Executive Director with the Greater New York Chamber of Commerce, and we call it Webinar Fridays. Um, we've been doing this, we've been doing, I've been doing this for close to 20 years, but since, uh, you know, the, uh, the pandemic, we have really Ubered up our information um, opportunities to get the word out there on how businesses can A, grow their business, B, save money, and uh, C, especially what we're doing today, there are many opportunities for uh, businesses to um, access capital and access money. And this is one of the ways that uh, this program is an opportunity for to see if you qualify to get money back um, during uh, the past two years. So right now, I am not knowledgeable about this um, employee uh, retention program. Um, uh, that's why we have uh, reindeer consultants on here right now. This is, we're not doing a PowerPoint presentation. This is A, being recorded. B, there's a chat going on for everyone. Put your information, put your questions in the chat. It's a very interactive type of opportunity for you to ask questions. If they can answer the questions, um, they will. Please do not put any personal information, your tax ID or any information. Um, about, uh, you know, if you've uh, applied for this program or you have questions about it, you will have the, the opportunity to speak to um, this group on a one-to-one -one basis. They will be giving out their contact information at the end. Again, this is being recorded, so it will be on Chamber TV. I'm going to turn it over to Patrick right now. Patrick, thank you for doing this. We've gotten a lot of questions about this program. Um, it's being advertised left and right and uh, take it away because I know that we're going to be using this. Uh, we have a hard stop at 11 o'clock, so I want you to take advantage of this. We will be monitoring the chat again for those who are joining us questions in the chat. So go ahead, Patrick. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, thank you, Helena, for bringing us on to discuss this as you mentioned, very important topic and conversation that every small business owner should be discussing. Um, as we like to say internally at Reindeer, not every small business qualifies for these tax credits, but every small business should take the time to investigate and see if they do. Um, so I'll introduce myself first. My name is Patrick Nussbaum. I'm a director here at Reindeer. Um, joining us today on the panel, we have Abraham Bornstein, our Director of Accounting. We also have Robert Gutman, our outside legal counsel. Um, Robert serves as general counsel to all reindeer's tax credit um, positions that we take on behalf of clients. We also have another director from Reindeer, Josh, with us on this call. And together, we're going to try to clarify on behalf of small business owners um, different concerns that we see arising again and again when it comes to this tax credit amongst others. So just a little bit of a background on what, who Reindeer is. Reindeer is a tax credit company that was formed to help the small businesses take advantage and get the accessibility that only large businesses would have to tax credits. So in the past 25 years, the US government, um, Uncle Sam, loves giving tax credits to businesses to entice businesses to continue to grow their business and help the American economy. Reindeer was formed because we noticed that there was an issue where small businesses were not able to access the level of expertise needed in order to take advantage of these credits. Um, to date, Reindeer has helped over 7,000 small businesses claim over $1 billion in tax credits. Um, thanks to our unbelievable teams and the small businesses that we serve. Um, this, this webinar is specifically about the employee retention credit. There's been a lot of noise and background noise. I'm sure if you get on TV, you turn on the radio, you're gonna hear something or another about the employee retention credit. What is it? Can you claim it? Can you take advantage of it? Is this something your business can claim Obviously it's lucrative, $26,000 per employee. So I'm gonna give a little bit of a background about the credit 
and then we're going to turn to our panelists to discuss the main concerns um, or questions that keep coming up. Um, the credit was first put into law through the CARES Act. That was done in March of 2020, all the way back in the beginning of the pandemic. At the time, the credit was not so popular due to the fact that um, you were not able to take this credit if you took a PPP. The credit you know, had a number of iterations where the government kept updating it to try to make it more accessible to business owners. So in November of 2020, with the Consolidated Appropriations Act, the government went out again and gave updates to the credit. Um, these updates that were kept you know, being added gave room for business owners to take advantage of it and make it more accessible. So the way we decided we were discussing how we're going to go about this webinar, the ERC is vast and there's a lot of different um, questions. We're going to discuss the four main questions and um, we're going to take it from there. Number one, number one, um, can you take the ERC credit if you did not have a decrease in revenue? So a lot of business owners understand the tax credit to be a credit that was created for businesses that suffered during the pandemic. That means a business that couldn't operate the same way it would operate pre pre COVID. And that's what the credit was created for. Now the misconception here, which is very dangerous and why a lot of businesses are not looking into this business owners understood that this credit was created for businesses that suffered um, and lost money. And the truth is the credit, which is, you know, you can tell from the name of it, employee retention credit. It's not necessarily if you lost money, it's about, did you retain employees during this difficult time? The U S government wanted to help business owners who retained employees and kept the economy going strong despite the pandemic. So I'm going to turn to our first panelist um, to discuss this first most important question. Can you claim this lucrative tax credit even if you did not have a decrease in revenue? So Abraham Bornstein, I'm gonna to turn to you to discuss a little bit more about claiming this tax credit, even if you did not have a decrease in revenue. Hi, good morning. I'm Abraham Bornstein. I'm the tax director, compliance director for Reindeer Consultants. So back to the question, um, can you claim this credit if you did not have a de decrease in revenue? Now, the IRS, the CARES Act actually gave two pathways for eligibility. One is a decrease in revenue and the other is a partial business suspension. Now, it wasn't that you need to have both. It was either or. You can either be eligible on a decline in revenue or you can be eligible based on a full suspension or partial business suspension. So the businesses that had a decline in revenue don't need to look into more detail if their business was suspended or not suspended because a decl decline in revenue does not have to be associated with a COVID guideline, with a COVID issue. It could just be business was slow. So you, you had a decline in revenue, so you're eligible. However, businesses that did not have a decline in revenue or they had a decline in revenue, but it wasn't at that percent that was required to, to be eligible. The decline in revenue in 2020 has to be 50% compared to the same quarter in 2019. And in 2021, it had to be a 20% decline in revenue based to the same revenue, the same quarter in 2019. So businesses did have decline in revenues, but not at that percent. Or some business, businesses had it in one quarter, not in the other quarter. Those businesses should look into how they were affected due to COVID, due to the government mandates, local mandates that affected their business operations. This, this has to be looked into with, uh, for some businesses, it's very simple. I was a restaurant. Okay, uh, there was a rule. No, uh, you can't have uh, uh, indoor dining. That's very simple. I was a retail store. Okay. That's also simple. You couldn't allow uh, a certain, more than a certain amount of, of, of uh, customers into your store. But there's a lot of different types of businesses that were affected by COVID, but they don't think they were affected by COVID, either because their revenue went up 
So how can I be affected if my revenue went up? Now it could be you changed your business operations. Maybe you were retail and you started selling online. So your revenue went up because you changed your business operations and now you're selling online. But your core business, which was pre-COVID, the retail business, that business was suspended. Or a business might say, well, we were able to modify, modify the, the, the operations so we're able to continue business. Now, that is an eligibility criteria because you modified your business operations to be able to continue your services. Now, that is the reason why the CARES Act is giving the ERC credit. They wanted businesses to modify the operations and keep their employees on payroll so that these employees don't go onto unemployment or other var or just lay them off. So, so that's why the, IR the CARES Act was giving this credit for businesses that even though they were continuing operations, but they had to modify due to COVID mandates, in those cases, you're still eligible based on the other criteria of partial business suspension. Now, there is a full business suspension and a partial business suspension. Now, obviously, a full business suspension is you have to close down. That's very, that's very simple. You have to close down. You're eligible based on closing down your business. Now, what about partial business suspension? The, they allowed reopening. There's a phased reopening. You can reopen your business. You can continue, but there is guidance how you could continue, how many customers you could allow into your store, how many employees you could allow into your store. What you have to close down for a certain period to, to, to clean your store, to, to sanitize your, your facility. What about that? Is that considered a partial business suspension? That's where we at Reindeer come in and we analyze everything that was changed or added or modified to your business operations to see if those, the combination of those constitute a, a partial business suspension so that you're eligible for this employee retention credit. Thank you, Abe. So to, 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 before I bring in Robert, our outside legal counsel, to summarize what um, Abe said in a little more detail, there are two pathways to claim this credit. One being that a business had a revenue reduction. The other being that the business had partial suspensions to their operations. As Abe said very eloquently, um, Every business is really based on the facts and circumstances and needs a further look to understanding what the business was, what the specifics of the business was, and were we affected as a business by government mandates. Now in New York City, um, the state of New York, the governor kept get putting out mandates all the way through March of 2021. Um, this credit is available all the way through um, the third quarter of 2021, there was a phased reopening for New York City, which affected a lot of businesses. So every business has their own facts and circumstances that can either prove qualification or not. Um, I'd like to introduce Robert again, who, you know, add his, um, his, his knowledge to this very important question of can a business qualify even if they did not have a decrease in revenue? Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, uh, Abe. Yeah, and I think I think it's the one point that uh, we keep having to emphasize to folks who come to us. Um, and, you know, it's counterintuitive. Uh, tax credits typically are very much math based, quantitative uh, driven analysis. Uh, you lost money, uh, you gain money, uh, you spend X amount of dollars on a particular product or service or government mandated or government encouraged um, service, uh, you claim the credit, solar panels, whatever the case may be. Um, this is very, very different. Uh, there have been employee retention credits uh, that were provided over the course of the last 20, 30 years. Typically they were quite obscure um, and had some of the same type of criteria, uh, but really were very, very uh, specific to particular sectors. Uh, this statute, the CARES Act, um, which was written, you know, kind of, I hate to say in a panic, but was written um, at the very onset of the pandemic, uh, when 
you know, there was a tremendous amount of anxiety, uh, both in the government and private sectors about what the economy was going to look like uh, in the next six months, given the looming uh, quarantine and isolation uh, that was imminent and that was already being rolled out. Uh, it was written, uh, I don't want to say ambiguously, but it definitely gives a practitioner uh, such as Abe, such as myself, and uh, a business owner uh, a certain, certain amount of space to maneuver. Uh, and by that, I mean the partial suspension criteria, which again, uh, I spend a good deal of my day uh, helping rein their clients with, uh, is not a black and white uh, analysis. Uh, it's not a black and white question. Uh, typically, again, like Abe said, this is an employee retention credit, and it seeks to provide a uh, reward, so to speak, to companies that soldiered on during the pandemic and maintained their employee count. And, and that's the key point um, that we emphasize again and again and again, uh, because we have many companies that come to us and say, look, we did pretty good. Or, you know, to give a very generic example, uh, we moved to only takeout um, if we were a restaurant and we were able to save on certain costs and, you know, business was booming. But obviously, we modified our operations substantially um, to comply with the directives of the state and the city and NOSHA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, are we eligible? And the answer is, and again, every case is different and we do not, at least not in rain there, um, there is no cookie cutter answer to any potential um, prospective uh, applicant towards a credit. Um, Abe and his team look very, very carefully at each and every potential uh, applicant and client to make sure that they're eligible. But the basic answer is that do not get dissuaded if your business stayed essentially status quo um, or even improved uh, because during the pandemic. What one needs to do uh, and that's often where I come in, is to go through all and any modifications that your business had to um, implement during 20 and part of 2021. Uh, and then, uh, you know, ideally you would tell us, well, we did this because we knew that the New York City Department of Health or New York State Department of Health said um, that we had to change our operations X, Y, and Z in order to comply with the pandemic, uh, pandemic driven uh, orders and directives that were being promulgated were being issued. That's fantastic. Um, some business owners don't always have a specific, you know, recollection of which statute they were, were, were referring to. They're not lawyers, they're business people, but they knew that they had to implement social distancing in their, in their retail operations. Um, they knew that they had to stagger shifts in their manufacturing operations. Um, they certainly knew that if they were providing any sort of um, health-based therapies or psychological um, or mental health type of uh, services, they had to keep group uh, group sessions to a bare minimum, uh, pretty much keep them, you know, basically suspend them for uh, a given amount of time. So even if they can't point directly to a specific executive order issued by Governor, then Governor Cuomo, or a, uh, you know, Mayor de Blasio, or anything like that, but if they tell us this is the stuff that they did because they wanted to comply in good faith, um, we can then help them pinpoint the specific government order. And I'll finish with that. The most important thing in all of this is that the change in operations in order to claim a partial suspension has to be linked and has to be, have been created by a government order. Um, it is not just simply, well, it was more convenient or we thought it made better business sense. Often the case, those two th things are simultaneously true, but it's the government order um, that becomes very, very important. And that's something that, you know, I've been able to help um, through the Aegis of Rain. There are a lot of uh, its clients to flesh out, to expand upon, um, always keeping in mind that, you know, these were real substantive modifications that occurred. Um, and they were linked and directly created because of the government orders. Um, and we can help, and we I often help, um, you know, folks uh, with an ability to document uh, specifically what those changes were and what the government orders that uh, fueled those changes uh, consisted of. Thank you, Robert. 
So this is a lot. So the question is, how as a business owner and how as a firm has Reindeer taken this subject, which can seem overwhelming, um, can seem like a lot because it's not just about having a revenue decrease. How has Reindeer taken this and helped the client and helped simplify this process on behalf of clients? Which really brings us to the next question that we hear time and time again. Why? Clients ask us all the time, why am I hiring an outside firm? Why can't I have my accountant work on this project for me? My accountant runs my finances. Um, they know my business. Why, can, why are they not taking a closer look at this? And why are they not helping me with this credit? It's a fair question. Um, the simple answer to that is, is that tax credits and specifically the, the employee retention credit, it's not so much a regular day-to-day -day accounting um, item. It's a specialized credit. It's like when you go to your general doctor, um, if you have an issue with your foot, you go to a foot specialist. Now a foot specialist may not know the same level of you know, data on the overall human body, but on, the foot, they're going to have, um, you know, they're going to have a bigger expertise. So when it comes to such a credit, you need a firm that focuses strictly on tax credits. Um, someone that really can take a deep dive and understand where the business qualified. And I'm going to turn to Josh, the director here at Reindeer to expand on that um, and explain a little bit more about why a specialist is needed. Josh, we don't we don't hear you. We can't hear you, Josh. So I guess Josh is having some difficulties. Um, so I'll, I'll expand on a little bit more. What has Reindeer done to take this process, which sounds very slow moving, very tedious, and taking it to um, a level where we could streamline it. How has Reindeer been able to help 7,000 clients, over 7,000 clients receive over a billion dollars in this credit? The short answer is we've spent a lot, a lot of time and energy taking deep dives and um, putting together data on every single industry. So when we start off with a business and you come to us and you're in telecommunications, we know what the telecommunications industry faced during the pandemic from our research. We know the government mandates that may have affected the telecommunications space. So when a business approaches Reindeer to check their eligibility for this credit, we're not starting from scratch. We're starting with a lot of data, a lot of detail on government mandates that may have affected the space, different businesses that are in the same industry that we've seen before. And we're able to quickly identify what we're looking for. Again, like Robert said, and like Abe said, a lot of businesses may have done better from a revenue perspective during COVID. Um, it's simply because revenue could mean that you had to raise your prices, price of goods went up, so you had to raise your price. And therefore you were able to, your revenue doesn't read as if you did had a bad year. But when you look at the modifications that the business had to endure, there was a lot of modifications that had to be done. So that's what Reindeer is going to try to help clients um, find those changes that they made to their business and help them qualify. Um, I want to move on to one of the next big questions that business owners have. And we're going to turn to Abraham Bornstein with this question to explain how Reindeer helps businesses claim the credit and maximize the credit. So the next question is, can I claim this credit if I had a PPP loan? What was the PPP loan? I'm sure all of us know what the PPP loan. For those of us who don't, the PPP loan was administered through the SBA, the Small Business Association. That was the most popular COVID era um, relief program. Business owners were able to get covered for, I think it was maybe two and a half times their monthly payroll. Um, it was a loan that then turned into a credit that was able to be forgiven. 
And a lot of business owners understood that if I took the PPP, I cannot take the ERC. Part of this confusion was, as I mentioned in the beginning of this webinar, there were a lot of changes to the ERC. Originally, you were not able to claim the ERC if you claimed the PPP. The government then came out and said, you can claim both, but there are specific um, guidelines that you have to follow when you do claim both. So I'm gonna to turn to Abraham Bornstein, our Director of Accounting, to expand a little bit on claiming PPP and ERC. Yeah, so first about the confusion about why if you receive the PPP, you can't claim the ERC. When the CARES Act came out, it was very clear that if you take the PPP, you cannot take the ERC. If you take the ERC, obviously you lose out on the PPP and the, the PPP was more lucrative at the time. So what most businesses did that could take the PPP, they took the PPP loan and they did not take the employee retention credit. Now, only very few select businesses, very large businesses that were not eligible for the PPP loan, those were the businesses that were taking the employee retention credit. It's interesting to note that the employee retention credit is now at the forefront of wherever you look, advertisements, and people are claiming it now. At the time, employee retention credit was a very little known uh, credit. It was in the CARES Act, but since most businesses didn't take it, they just went for the PPP loan, the employee retention credit was not looked at, not by accountants, not by payroll companies, not by businesses. Um, at the time, I was actually helping large businesses that could not take the PPP loan to claim the employee retention credit. But as time went on and they enacted the Consolidated Appropriations Act and in December of 2020, they changed the rules. Now you could take the employee retention credit even though you took the PPP loan. And you can go back retroactively from the second quarter of 2020 if you're eligible, you can still claim the employee retention credit, even though you receive the PPP loan and going forward, because in the beginning of 21, they were giving out the second round of PPP loans. Businesses were obviously taking the second round of PPP, whoever could take it, because that was more lucrative than employee retention credit. So they took the second PPP. Some of the businesses did not take the employee retention credit at the time. They weren't sure. They were still thinking that you can't take it because there were a lot of rules of the overlapping rules. So businesses just ignored the employee retention credit up until they realized that you could take both, but it's not that simple. So when we talk about the PPP and employee retention credit, both credits are based on your payroll, but a PPP loan is based on the payroll you had. So you have to have payroll to, after you receive the PPP loan to use up the PPP money on payroll. And the same as the employee retention credit. The employee retention credit is based on wages you paid. As you already said before, it was also created to encourage uh, businesses to retain employees. However, the same payroll that is used for PPP cannot be used for, the for wages as employee retention credit. So businesses that took the PPP loan were now left figuring out what was used for PPP what, what can I still have for ERC or can I maximize it? Maybe there are some employees that I can only claim PPP and not the ERC. And all these questions arise, which created, uh, first of all, for accountants and payroll companies, which this was, this was out of their purview to calculate, to figure out not just how to be in compliance with all the rules, but to maximize. So what I've seen a lot of payroll companies do, if just they just remove the full 24 weeks of the PPP loan. So when you apply for forgiveness for PPP, you put a start date, an end date for how long you use the money, 24 weeks, and they just remove 24 weeks. 24 weeks is a long time. Nobody really needed 24 weeks to use up their PPP money. Within two and a half months, it was all used up because it was based on two and a half months of payroll. But in order not to not to violate any IRS rule, they just removed everything. Now, obviously that's a big loss for a customer, for a business, especially in 2021. If you remove six months of payroll for PPP, which is not needed, 
and you, you don't claim the employee retention credit for the, those six months, you obviously lost out on a very large amount of money that businesses need to, to pay their employees. So what we do at Reindeer is we don't just remove 24 weeks. Uh, we don't just remove your payroll costs because there's other factors involved in PPP. There is non-payroll costs. You were able to use 40% of your PPP loan for non-payroll costs. Now, when companies applied for forgiveness, they would put their full payroll on the forgiveness form, the full 24 weeks of payroll. Now, you don't have to remove all that payroll for ERC. You only need to remove what was actually needed for the PPP loan, how much you borrowed. If you borrowed a million and you had payroll of 2 million and you put on your forgiveness loan that you spent 2 million, you don't have to remove the full 2 million from ERC wages because it's even more than your whole loan. So, so here we at Reindeer, we have a team, we have a software which, which we first use that to import all your payroll and all your PPP information, all your relative information and all of that to first make sure that we're only claiming it for the payroll that we're allowed to claim it. Then we make sure to maximize it. Every payroll, every single payroll, that was not used for PPP or other credits and other grants, which gets a little bit more complicated because there were more grants in the Curious Act and there's other credits that companies could have claimed. We take all that information, we consolidate it into one big report and everything that needs to be removed gets removed. And then we maximize the ERC. So when a client receives their final report, they can see every payroll it was used for PPP, a grant, a credit, or ERC. And then there are some, let's say, employees that they, they're not eligible for the employee retention credit. So we apply uh, payroll costs for PPP to those employees, which relieves some payroll from other employees that we can use for the employee retention credit. So these are just a few snippets of, of what's built in into our software to not just be in compliance, but to maximize the credit so that you receive the full refund the full credit that you can potentially receive thank you abe thank you for um those words josh we're still not picking up on your um audio okay so um so so as abe explained ppp and erc to summarize you can claim both um, you can claim the employer retention credit even if you claim the ERC. Not just could you claim it, but there are specific ways to make sure that you maximize it. The only rule that the government put out was please don't double dip. So if you got a PPP loan, you got it forgiven by paying off payroll, you cannot claim the ERC, which is claimed against payroll. You cannot claim it against the same payroll that was used to um, forgive the PPP. But a lot of times businesses have remaining payroll because the PPP only covered three months of payroll. Employer retention credit um, covers a year and a half. So knowing how to maximize it and how to distribute payroll amongst the two credits can be the difference between a business um, qualifying for a lot more or disqualifying unnecessarily and losing out on some of the credit. Um, I want to move to a more broader um, part of the employer retention credit. So we got a little bit involved in the details. Can you claim it with PPP? Can you claim it without a revenue reduction? I wanna talk a little bit about how this credit is claimed, where it's claimed um, and what the opportunity is. So why is there so much noise about ERC? The reason why there's so much noise is because this credit different than PPP um, is a tax credit. What is a tax credit? A tax credit is something that the government either depends if the government creates it as a refundable credit or a non-refundable credit. A non-refundable credit usually becomes a credit that gets added towards your sort of think of it like your account with the IRS. And when you have future tax liabilities, you can offset those liabilities by credits that you have. This credit is an actually a refundable tax credit. What does that mean? That means that businesses will receive a check in the mail for the amount of this credit. Um, the credit is very lucrative. It provides business owners up to $26,000 per employee. 
So if you have a business with 10 employees, 15 employees, potentially you could be looking at $200,000 to a quarter of a million dollars worth of this credit. <clears throat> the way this credit is claimed, it's claimed on your 941s, which is your payroll tax form. You have to take those forms and amend them. Um, a firm like Reindeer would help with amending those forms and claiming the credit on your behalf. Um, and this brings us to one of our last points that we want to discuss on this webinar before we take your questions, which is um, what are some of the advantages of working with a specialty, a specialty firm? So the credit, obviously, as you've seen over here a little bit, there's a lot going on. Um, besides for that, the IRS is very particular about how they want you to claim this credit. And, you know, if, if you're a business owner, you know how difficult it is dealing with the IRS, um, the delays that the IRS can have. And um, there's a lot besides for actually claiming the credit until you actually have the credit and the check in the mail in your hands. And a specialty firm is a firm that can also help you by making sure that when you claim this credit, not only do you claim it, but you claim it correctly. Just to give an example, which may sound a little funny, um, the IRS, you have to send in paper forms to the IRS and you have to staple those forms on the top left-hand side of the page. Um, this sounds gimmicky, but um, this is something that we've seen clients come to us and say, I sent in my forms, I did everything correctly. Why has my credit not been processed? It's been a year and a half, I'm waiting on this credit. And the answer could sometimes be something as simple as, what side of the page did you staple it on? The IRS is looking, they're overwhelmed. Um, they're always overwhelmed, even with the new um, you know, budget that they've been given. And they're looking for reasons to throw out any and all claims. So when claiming this credit, you have to be careful with the smallest details, making sure the signature is on the right page, making sure it's stapled correctly, um, and so on. So I want to turn to um, Helena, I guess. Is, is this how we'll do it? You'll, you'll bring up the questions in the chat box um, and our panelists will have the opportunity to answer some of the questions. Yes, this was actually very, very informative. Um, and you hit on a lot of the questions that um, people have approached the chamber with, which of course, um, I am not an expertise on this at all. Um, so one of the questions I'm going to go back and you, you pretty much answered it, but, um, how, how has receiving PPP loans affect ERC eligibility? And they actually did. You can, you know, I, I don't know if you want to rehash it. I'm just, you know, making sure that we hit all the questions. You did say you can get the money you can apply if you receive PPP money, correct? Correct. correct. Okay. Um, the next question is, and I have some questions that people have, uh, has, uh, sent me along the way. Um, let me go back. Okay. What about if your modification to your business raised the amount of money you made? Yeah. So, so, so that's a common that's one. That's a great and question. I, I want Abraham, I, I want, I want Robert to, um, address from a legal perspective and then you'll take over. This is a great, great question. A lot of businesses made changes that actually helped their business. The best example of this is a restaurant. Um, you know, if you're in New York City, you know all about it. The restaurants expanded their space. Um, they, they've almost doubled in size with, with being able to add seating outdoors and being able to do delivery and outdoor dining. So th <coughs> that's a perfect example of a business that may have really benefited from the changes. But Robert, I'll let you discuss this. Yeah, and I actually saw that question. And it, it is a great question. And it goes back to what I said previously, which is to some extent for a variety of reasons, um, eligibility towards this tax credit is sometimes somewhat counterintuitive. Um, the, the answer is that um, if you complied with government orders that were issued as a response to the pandemic, 
um, and you did what you had to do to comply, um, the unintended consequence of you uh, making more money for whatever reason uh, as a result does not prevent you uh, from applying for this credit. And, and time and time again, and, and Patrick, Josh, and Abe um, certainly will, would echo this, uh, we, we speak to folks and they're like, no, I actually did great during, uh, during the pandemic. And yes, I had challenges. I had to rejigger staffing and I had to, you know, um, do, a, you know, things that were done and were key in-person meetings were now shifted to remote and issues. And, and, you know, my, my entire, I spent a significant amount of money on physical barriers and PPP, PPE, and they list 10, 15 factors that really did uh, change in a fundamental way how they operated. Uh, but nonetheless, they were, you know, even or even made some more money or more profit for those quarters. Uh, so they think there's not a chance, a snowball chance, and you know what, that they are eligible. But the answer is that they might very well be. Um, and that's why it's important uh, for you to talk to somebody who understands the credit and does the credit on a very regular basis and deals with this credit um, day in and day out because they can give you the guidance that you need. And, and really, 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 um, you're leaving money on the table if you don't uh, give yourself the opportunity uh, to at least explore whether this credit is suitable for your company. And, and, and Alina, I want to add to that something, which is, I guess, like Robert said, an unfortunate um, consequence of the way this credit was written. When the government writes a credit, they're writing it for a broad audience. And a lot of times when you're writing a credit for 50 million small businesses, you're going to end up having some businesses that made a lot more money qualify for the credit. And you'll have businesses that really suffered not qualify. And how is that possible? You could have a business that really suffered. Their revenue was really down. But when you look at the revenue, it was only down 19%. And it didn't hit the 20% threshold that may be needed as far as revenue. Um, but maybe that business is a software business. So they didn't have to modify anything for their business because they always work remote. So that's a business right there that maybe really struggled but cannot qualify for this credit. While you can have a restaurant that did extremely well and did outdoor dining and delivery, um, but they still modified their business and they still qualify for this credit. I would point uh, out that we see time and time again, particularly in the healthcare arena, um, we see companies that because of changes in Medicare reimbursement or other federal pro government uh, programs, actually made more profit during 2020 and 21, but nonetheless, because they were serving, serving vulnerable uh, populations, um, they had to do incredible amount of work um, in modifying their operations. Uh, those guys, to me at least, are clearly eligible. And the fact that they might've made more money revenue-wise or maybe even net profit-wise, that should not forbear them from, from a very clear, in most cases, uh, path to being eligible towards it for, for the ERC. So it is a little hard to um, get it into one's head um, that uh, you could have not suffered on your bottom line, but still because of the way you rejiggered operations, you're still very much eligible for the ERC. Thank you so much. We have a lot more questions. So um, I know that you hit up, uh, you address this, if there was not a change on the operations, but a decrease only in one of the quarters, can a company be eligible? Abraham. Yeah, so if a company is not eligible based on uh, a partial business suspension, then we look at decline in revenue. And a decline in revenue makes you eligible for the quarter that you had the decline in revenue. Um, also for the quarter afterwards. It's a bit of complicated uh, uh, calculation because 2020 is different than in 21. 2020, if you had a decline of 50%, you're eligible for that quarter and for one quarter afterwards up until you had 80%. And we obviously re have a system to review that when we import your, your revenue numbers. And in 2021, it's usually you're eligible for that quarter in the following quarter. That's usually how it works when there's and a decline of revenue. What are the guidelines for small business? Uh, well, this is a general question. Limitations for less than 500 employees. You did address that because it, it's this. It's all correct. It's 
there aren't any limitations. It depends on so, what. So if, yeah, if you're a small business with less than 500 employees, you don't have anything to worry about. The questions actually start if you're a business that has more than 500 W-2 employees. So then the question is <clears throat> understanding if those employees were full-time employees or not. But if you're a small business um, with less than 500 employees, there's nothing to worry about. Um, if you already used 24 weeks of payroll to satisfy the PPP loan forgiveness when it was met with fewer weeks of payroll expense and subtracted that full amount in calculating what you filed for the ERTC, can you recalculate your credit and file a second amended 941 for the same quarters? I don't know if you can answer that. You might want to, you might want to just uh, have them reach out to you on a personal basis. Yeah. Is that the, the sh fair? The short, the short answer is yes. You could claim another amended 941X to claim the difference. It's obviously entails more work. It's more complicated. It's we have to first check if the IRS process the first one. But the short answer is yes. It can be done. Okay. Um, and also, while you know, you guys might want to get a slide going or put something in the chat with all your who they should contact for yes. you know to follow that up. Um, we're not done yet. Uh, they want to know if you want to answer this. What are the costs for the services? Do you ch charge a percentage of the recovery? So the way we charge is actually. Um, we look at this as small business owners ourselves. How can we do this in a way where we give small businesses the opportunity to look into this credit, but not have to commit funds? Um, when I started this webinar, one of the first things, the idea behind Reindeer was, how do we bring um, big business opportunities to small businesses and help the small businesses get accessibility to these um, credits and services that are generally only available to large corporations. So what Reindeer did was Reindeer created a model which is success-based. We only charge if we're successful on behalf of the client. There is no upfront fee. Um, we only take a, correct, we take a percentage of the credit. Um, and the reason why we built it this way was we felt that give the small businesses an opportunity to see if they qualify. Um, because we've built so much um, technology into our system, we're able to invest the time and energy into each small business to really look at the facts and circumstances and understand if they qualify or not. So we're able to provide this on a success basis. And only if we're successful, do we take a, a percentage of the credit amount. Thank you so much. Someone asked, how do you vet an ERC service firm? Or there seems to be many overnight firms with no track record. I can answer that. So the, the reason why Reindeer put this presentation on is because they are a corporate partnership with the Greater New York Chamber of Commerce. They have been coming on to our online networking uh, and showing that uh, and telling us about the importance of putting on a webinar like this. So uh, uh, I, I can answer it for the reason why they are on be, is because they have shown their interest in helping small business. So um, other than that, I would definitely, you know, up oh, Robert. I, I, I would tell you that if you are approached or you do approach an ER, ERC company that says un, with, without any qualif qualifications that you're definitely eligible for the ERC, um, run like run for the hills um, because those guys are precisely the type of people you don't want to be dealing with. And if they say that you're eligible for every quarter, um, again, many, many, many of our of Reindeer's clients are, um, but that has to be reviewed and has to be analyzed. And that's why I think you know Josh, Patrick, and Abe are very different than a good percentage of the folks um, who are dealing with this credit is that they are very cautious. Um, and they are not going to apply or advise that a application for a particular quarter should be made unless everybody in the, on the team feels very confident um, that indeed the eligibility and the 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 applicant uh, truly is you know is is eligible and should be taking this credit for that particular quarter. How long, uh, quick question, how long does it usually take to find out? People have been, you know, emailing me and saying, 
Um, I applied and, you know, six, I think it's at least six months, correct? So the actual process of um, understanding if you qualify depends on the firm that you're working with. How good is their technology, right? Because there is a lot of work that has to get done. Um, it also depends on the client. How, how responsive are you when documents are needed or questions are asked? Um, having said that, our process generally takes two to three weeks um, from when a client onboards until we have a determination of if they qualify. The time period that actually is taking a little longer is the IRS is very backed up in processing these credits. So once you confirm that you're qualified for this and you prepare your documents and you send it in, there is a wait time, which is what I touched on a little earlier is you want to <coughs> work with a firm that not only will um, process the credit for you, but also be there to hold your hand along that wait period to make sure if any questions or issues arise, they can help you and make sure the IRS processes. But short answer, two to three weeks if the client's responsive, and then pr approximately four to six months to actually receive the credit. What ha I've gotten this uh, three times today. What happens if they apply through a, a, a organization, but they are just not responsive? Can they go to a, someone like you and reapply? Well, I, I really think that would depend on, you know, the, again, the details of that. Did Got they it. apply? Did okay. they claim it? Is, was it submitted? Got it. Can a business qualify for ERC by employees receiving 1099 or the business or the business only would be eligible only employees receiving W-2s? That's a good question. That's a great question. Abe, you can answer that question. Yeah, so, so this credit is only for W-2 employees. It's the same for PPP. PPP was only for your W-2 employees and the same goes for employee retention credit. It's only for your W-2 employees. and. The 1099 employees, you cannot claim the ERC credit, and they also are removed from the employee count. For the 100 to the 500 employee count, you can remove the 1099 employees. They're not considered employees of your company. Got it. Good. I have another good question. If an um, ERC audit happens years later, do the ERC services firms stand behind their work? Should this be part of your contract with an ERC services company? Most definitely. Every business owner should understand what the, what the um, company is providing them as far as a service um, when they do create the, cre the credit application for them. Um, one of the things that Reindeer's motto is, is audit ready. Um, we aim to have every client audit ready before we send it out the door. So <clears throat> we've seen audits. We've seen what's happening. The audits, um, they usually ask questions on you know, please show backup of the calculations, how you calculated the credit, um, what were the government mandates. So every client of ours, before we submit it, they receive a packet with all that information. So if there's any questions, they are audit ready and audit protected. Very important, good question. Um, I'm just quickly going through this again. Um, Everyone's asking, yes, this is being recorded. I keep on saying it will be on Chamber TV so you can reference this. Um, did I answer this? What if the 941s are done by your PEO? Did I ask that? Um, I don't think you uh, no. asked that, no. Okay. The short answer is, is that PEOs are a lot more complicating and unless the business is a very large business with a very large credit potential, most firms will not assist businesses that work with a PEO. Um, for a business to be able, do your employees have to have to, oh, for a business to be eligible, do your, this is, do your employees have to have W-2s on the business uh, or we address that or the 1099s, you just talked about that. Um, how is receiving PPP? We did that. I'm just making sure that we're getting every, uh, all the questions answered. Um, now, can you can you call uh, directly to the IRS to uh, to um, find out what the status of your application is? So, 
you can call. <laughs> you can wait on hold for a while. Um, you can call, and the IRS. The, the 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 frustrating part is is that they they don't have a beautiful updating system where they provide updates. Um, you know, on a constant basis, they either say it was processed or it wasn't processed. So there's limited visibility into what's going on. All you know is, is that they received your documents and they're processing them and they're on the queue. Got it. Um, we have uh, one, one uh, someone keeps on asking about, uh, does going fully remote potentially qualify? I don't think that should be. And the answer is that, that depends. Um, if it's a type of business that seamlessly went remote and it really didn't create any issues, then that's not a factor. If it's a business that um, really relies on in-person type of services and meetings, et cetera, et cetera, um, it could be a factor towards being eligible under the partial suspension test. Right. Um, I, I want to address this and um, people have been asking what percentage of the credit that you take, if you're comfortable with it, it, or you, you know, it depends on the client. You can an, you can answer that. You know, they can email you for that and let them look at, you know, your case with them on a one to one basis. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's 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 really it's not the type of question. I you know I would love to give a clear answer, and it's not that you know we're trying to not be concise, but every it really depends on the circumstance of the business every business has different circumstances and different you know if someone approaches us they they already claimed some of it and they need help understanding what they amended so it's really it's a service business it's it, you know you can't put a price on it's just it's e basically. yeah just email them and they'll they're they'll get back to you uh, that's a you know that's the reason why. Right. Um, yeah. And we shared we shared the email information. It's simple info at reindeerconsultants.com. Reindeer okay. is EI, reindeer. Um, and it's in the chat box if anybody needs it. Um, we also shared a link to um, apply directly and get the process started. Perfect. One other question, and then we're going to close it up. What basic paperwork data? Because I've gotten this, would you ask for QuickBook? Uh, files, copies of tax returns, 941s. I'm a two-person corporation. Don't you have a min don't you have to have a minimum of five employees? Is that true? Correct. We um, you have to have a minimum of five. Reindeer generally works with employers who have 10 or more. Um, and Abe could give you a little bit about what documents we need. Abe, you're on mute. Yeah, okay. So yeah, the the information that we request is basically everything that we're going to need for the credit. There's going to be uh, detailed payroll reports, 941s, other credits claimed, PPP information. We have a whole team dedicated to helping you find these reports, help you process these reports if you need help. So it shouldn't be a burden on the client to gather all this information. We actually help you. We hold your hand step by step until we gather all the information. So it's not just uh, we're uh, overload on you to gather all all of this information. Wonderful. Well, you know what? Uh, someone asked where are the contact details for reindeer. It is um, it, it is on there. You can also email me. Um, I will definitely send you their contact information if you guys can drop it in one more time before we close yep. it out. Um, it is being recorded. If you want to go back to this presentation, this was unbelievable. Good questions. You guys did a fabulous job for answering the questions that I really thought um, that needed to be answered that I've been getting and just uh, what I read about and people have been emailing me because a lot of small businesses don't have an HR department or they don't have an accountant and they do qualify for things like this. Um, so, you know, thank you, Patrick, Robert, Abraham. Uh, Josh um, and uh, uh, you know Sarah, I know you're on there. Thank you for working with us. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to them. If you if you have any questions, email me. I'll forward you. Uh, I'll forward the questions to them. Um, again, thank you for doing this. This was so informative. You, an I'm telling you, you answered some really hard questions and things that uh, need to be. Um, uh, communicated to small businesses because they don't have this. They don't have the opportunity to ask these questions. Like I said, a lot of companies don't have 
uh, you know, an accounting department or an HR department. So it's great that they have that. And also just keep in mind, um, you know, during the PPP, a lot of people, a lot of, you know, they, they finally got it together. I would say the SBA and all the, the uh, federal and state funding. But if you imagine, we've never been through this in the country and for them to turn around these programs and get money into the hands of the businesses, even though it took, a, you know, a little bit of time, I think it, it they did okay, you know, so, uh, you know, I have to, you know, put my hats off to the SBA for, you know, communicating and providing these opportunities as well as this program, especially what Reindeer is doing right now is communicating all that information back to the small business, whether you're a small business, an entrepreneur, medium-sized major corporations, please reach out to them if they, you have any questions. They are the expertise on that and that's, they are a community partner with the Greater New York Chamber of Commerce, and we appreciate their support. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join today. Um, and again, our email address is in the comments. Um, this will be recorded and will be shared. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank everyone. Have a great weekend. Enjoy this beautiful weather. Oh, and don't forget, if I still have people on Tuesday at 10 o'clock, online networking. Should be great if you're, you know, just want to grow your business with us. So thank you so much. Talk to you later, everyone. Bye-bye.